Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Hoffman. I serve as the North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota Extension Sheep Specialist. But as a diversified agriculturalist, I get the opportunity to moderate this evening's presentations. And this evening we will be joined by Lisa Peterson and Dr. Jerry Stucka on Can Your System Sustain the Ranch? And so I've known Lisa for a long time and I appreciate her background in the livestock and primarily beef cattle industry and the understanding of our system and how we can be able to make decisions and combine it holistically uh, for our operations. And so Lisa grew up in Colorado uh, and has been here and as a, a person uh, and an employee of North Dakota State University system and serves as uh, an extension livestock specialist and also as our North Dakota Beef Quality Assurance Coordinator. Uh, as you see, you have a poll in front of you of which of the following best describes you as rancher, consultant, extension, researcher, or other. And so if you kindly fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, in regards to our questions, uh, we would prefer that you chose the Q&A box so that we can organize those. There is a chat box open as well, uh, but we'd prefer that the questions go in the Q&A so that we can keep them sorted out if you uh, so aspire. There's also the opportunity to, again, we'll move through those and we'll have a little bit of break in between uh, before we move to uh, Dr. Jerry Stuckas and Lisa. Please help us learn how we can, how our system can sustain the ranch. The floor is yours. Well, good evening, beautiful people. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I assume that a few more people will probably come in as we get going. And so uh, as we get started tonight, I would first of all like to thank our Extension Livestock team who are with us tonight. Um, that includes Dr. Jana Block. She's our Livestock Specialist at the Hedinger Research Extension Center. And if you're not familiar with North Dakota, Hedinger is in the very southwest corner of the state. Uh, Dr. Miranda Meehan, she is our, and I'm probably going to slaughter it, Miranda, so I'm sorry, but our uh, natural resource, uh, I'm going to call it uh, uh, not sustainability, but uh, that endeavor of um, in our animal science department. She also is on our livestock team. She currently serves as our leader and then Dr. Travis Hoffman. So thank you all very much. It takes a team to make all of this work and we're very fortunate to have such a good team. And I apologize to Miranda for slaughtering her title. I'm not a good titles person. So as we get started, if you come in, if you would vote on our poll, um, and then I'm gonna um, end that here shortly as you come in. Um, and I actually might ask Miranda, she's a better polling person than me. Miranda, can I keep that up and keep going, or does it? Uh, do I need to end it? So you can keep it up um, if you've answered it and it's blocking your screen. You can just check the little X in the corner, and it'll and you can remove it from your site. Okay, we'll leave that up for a little bit, and maybe as people come in, they will answer that. So our team uh, had a discussion here several weeks ago about reports of cows being open and calves being sick. And this has kind of been a continual problem for a few years. And so we had a discussion about where we should go with that, if we should do anything. And we all agreed that we should probably somehow address that. And we talked about, you know, what we would do to do that. And so uh, we came up with this webinar series, as um, you all probably know, uh, meetings are particularly hard in this uh, COVID environment. So we came up with a webinar series and entitled it, Can Your System Sustain the Ranch? And uh, really the goal is, um, what is going on in our operations, both from a cattle standpoint, a management standpoint, and uh, uh, next week, Miranda, uh, Kevin Sedovic, and Jana will talk about the nutrition and the natural resource standpoint. So I'm going to lead us off tonight and talk a little bit about um, the genetics of sustainability in terms of a ranch. And I need to give some credit to Dave Lawman and Rick Machen. Um, I have to admit, very few of these ideas are my own. I picked them up from them on a webinar that uh, 
I did, that they did that I was a part of about eight months ago. So what traits are the most, most highly linked to profitability in a cow herd? And when you really look at it, and, and if you look through the literature, it's really winning rate. And winning rate is uh, that percentage of cows that have been exposed that end up winning a calf the following year. And so if we want to look at that in terms of 2020, that would be the number of calves that we have weaned or are going to wean this fall if we have a spring calving operation divided by the number of cows exposed last year. And this all ends up being a pretty holistic function of reproduction, genetics, nutrition, and then calving ease, cow condition, and calf health. And uh, Dr. Stuck and I will talk about how all these little pieces go together to make one big system and hopefully a sustainable, profitable system at the end of the day. So the value of reproduction, you know, if I ask producers, what is the goal for your operation? Very few of them tell me, uh, well, my goal is to make the most money, or very few of them tell me that I'd like to get, you know, 95% of my cows bred in the, the breeding season, in a, a defined breeding season. Um, most of them tell me my goal is to wean off the heaviest calves in the community. And, you know, Dr. Stuckett and I talk, should that be 500 pounds, 600 pounds, 800 pounds? What should that number be? And at the end of the day, all those things are great, but if we don't have reproduction, we don't have any of them. And so if you do a little bit of a literature search on the value, the financial value of reproduction, you'll find that we have been discussing the financial value of reproduction uh, clear back even into the, the early 1900s. And some of the more recent data says that reproductive efficiency is the most important factor impacting the economics of a cow calf operation. Uh, Benton Glaze, my colleague at the University of Idaho, says that reproductive efficiency determines to a great extent the profitability of a beef cattle enterprise. Uh, Trinkle and Wilhelm actually wrote in Nature, um, the publication Nature, Nature Magazine, in 1977 that the economic value of reproduction for a cow-calf producer was reported to be five times greater than growth. Uh, Schiefelbein, uh, who was at the time working for the American Gelvy Association, looking at a very vast set of Gelvy data, said that the relative economic weight of reproduction, growth, and product traits, and when we look at product traits, we're talking about uh, the carcass traits, um, is four to two to one. And so four in terms of reproduction, so reproduction, um, and when you look at this, would be four uh, times more important than the carcass traits and twice as important as the growth traits. And Burke Teichert is well known to say that reproduction is what the ranch has to sell in relation to the size of the cow herd. And Stan Beavers, who is um, the livestock economist uh, with Texas A&M, says in the grand scheme of things, just give me one more calf to sell. So let's look at the numbers of all of this. Uh, the impact of weaning rate or the percent weaned. And again, um, that is the, the percentage of calves that you weaned compared to the number of cows exposed in that breeding season. So if in 2019, we uh, exposed 300 cows in the spring summer of 2019 and in the fall of 2020, you weaned off 235 calves. Um, and I'm gonna try to get a laser up here so that we can see. We weaned off 235 calves. That ends up being a percent weaned of about 78%. So to uh, get to that number, we started off with 300 cows at preg check time. We had 45 open, so that was 85% bred, 15 open. Uh, we lost 10 sometimes in the some place in the gestational uh, period between preg check and calving. So that ends up being 3% loss, and we lost 10. Uh, sometime after calving. So if that was right after birth or, you know, one got struck by lightning or something like that. Uh, so that ends up being 3% too. So all told, that ends up being about 78%. Now, if you look over here on the right-hand side, we're going to keep um, 
the 3% that are lost gestationally and the 3% lost post calving the same, but we are going to have more bred cows. So we're gonna end up uh, with 30 open is compared to 45 on the left-hand side. That equals 90% bred, and that means that we have 10% uh, a loss or 10% open. That ends up being 83% weaned. So what difference does all that make? Does it really matter? So here's some economics of that. When we compare again on the left-hand side, that weaning rate of 78%, to the weaning rate on the right-hand side of 83%. And if you look at this uh, chart, across the top are our production costs. And most of our data shows that our cow-calf producers are between $650 and $850 of cow-calf of cow cost a year. Uh, now that's including a return to labor and management and uh, depreciation. So that is across the top here. And then across the left-hand side is that percent weaned. And so if you'll remember back here, that percent weaned for the left-hand side is 78%. It's 83% for the right-hand side. As you look at the breakout of this, 78% weaned. The best that we can do for a break-even is we might make it if our production cost is $700 per cow. Um, that actually, that break-even is at $698, $699. So at calves selling last week uh, across our North Dakota reported markets, the average weight last week was 575, and they averaged 155, uh, 155 and 77 cents per hundred weight. This is where that break even lies out, is at this 156 down here. So that means that if your weaning rate is at 78 percent, you have to have a cow production cost someplace less than $700 to break even. Now, when we compare that over here to the winning rate of 83%, again, we have calves at 575 pounds. Uh, they brought 155.77 per hundred last week. When we move up that weaning rate to 83%, our break even now, uh, we can get clear up here almost to $750. That break even in cow cost is actually $743. So it makes a huge amount of difference in what we can have in terms of cost or what we have to, I guess, take off the table in terms of cost for break even. Dr. Stucka, did I uh, explain that right? Yes, very well. Sorry, Lisa, I'm on mute. That's okay. I just wanted to make sure that that made a little bit of sense. Dr. Stuck and I talked about how to best explain this earlier today, so it makes sense. So all of these gray shaded boxes are where we are out of the profitability sector. We don't have a chance to, to make it profitability-wise, I guess, in, in this scenario. And so um, we need to be really cognizant, I think, of this winning rate. And, you know, if we got this winning rate up to 93%, we have a lot more options. Or if you can drop your, your production costs down to $650, you have even more options. And the best option is if you can combine them both. So all this is fine and dandy. And I can hear my dad saying, you know, how in the world are you going to change this, you smart extension, you smart academic people? And that is a great question because sometimes the numbers and on paper, it makes it sound a lot easier to do. And I'm sure some of you are pretty tired of hearing us talk about body condition scoring. And I wanna tell you, this is the reason why we talk about body condition scoring so often. And I'm not telling you that you need to look at every cow and say that she's, this one's a three and that one's a four and this one's a three and oh, maybe that one's a three and a half. What I'd really encourage you to do is say, okay, these cows are less than a four. These cows are maybe in the four to five range. Uh, these cows are better than a six. And if we're looking at heifers, maybe we say these heifers are four and less, these heifers are five and six, and then up. And uh, the way that we encourage folks to do that is to look at the last two ribs. If you can see these last two ribs, that means that your cows or your heifers are in a body condition score of less than five. If you can't see those last two ribs, they're greater than a five. And that's a, such a great place to start. And then if you can see that spine or feel that spine, they're less than or equal to a three. And then 
the last step here is to look at the thurl, and I learned that from the dairy folks. That's the shape between the hooks and the pins. And so if that shape gets into a strong V, like I'm showing here, that's a three, but if these end up being in a U shape, and the flatter they become, you become higher in a body condition score. So when we talk about body condition score, this is the reason why we really push it and why we encourage producers to manage for it. So this is some data that came out of the Padlock Ranch. Um, it was reported by Cherney in 1995, and it looked at um, eight years, nine years of data at the Padlock Ranch in Wyoming. And so what they did was that they looked at cattle that were less than a body condition score uh, three all the way to greater than a six at weaning time. And then they compared that to the pregnancy rate for spring calving cows. And so you can see that if those cows were less than a three at weaning time, they're about 76%. All the way, you make a big jump from a, a less than a three to a four, and then another big jump between a four and a five. So what this tells us is even as cows gain some condition through the summer, we have a better chance for getting those cows pregnant the next year. This data looks at the effect of body condition scores on, uh, at calving on serum immunoglobulin levels. And the goal of this, uh, of IgGs and passive transfer, isn't that they need to hit a certain level. It's one of these things that we need to get as much of that IgG and passive transfer in those calves as we can get. And so when you see that you're down here at a body condition score three, we're at about 2,000, but if you can move your cows clear up to a six, you end up uh, moving them clear up to about 2,300. And that's a great thing. That's uh, one of the things that our team sees at calving time is that these thinner cows tend to not only, only not re rebreed, but they also have sicker calves. And so uh, uh, here's another good reason to have your cows in good rig. So at least a five for a mature cow and a six for first calf heifers at calving time. Now I'm going to use this data set uh, and the data that comes with it for the next couple of slides. So this is from data from Oklahoma State. Uh, Glenn Selk published this in 1986. Uh, and it looked at the pregnancy rate at calving, uh, um, excuse me, the effect of body condition score uh, at calving time on the next uh, breeding season or the upcoming breeding season. And so those cows that were in a body condition score four at calving, uh, when they needed to get rebred in the next two months, only half of them did. Uh, when they moved that body condition score up to a five, uh, they take a huge jump, a 31% jump in pregnancy rate. And so, you know, I, I think it's a pretty good jump from a five to a six, but to get from a six to a seven, you don't gain as much. Now, one of the things that I would say just as my own opinion is that in our uh, North Dakota climate, northern climates, I think we gain, we're, we're better off to have our cows closer to a seven than a four. And so if that meant that you gave your cows a little more nutrition, and you're on the bubble of a six to a seven, I would be uh, personally happier with that than uh, being down here closer to the four. And that's just my own opinion. It, I think it gives them more cushion to deal with our, our tougher winter environment. So as we look at this data from the left and its impact on improvement in conception rate and then increased revenue per cow, you can see that when we go from a body condition score four to five at calving, we end up increasing uh, conception 31%, and that increases our revenue per cow in the herd $262. If we go from a five to a six, we increase that uh, conception 7%, and we increase that revenue about $60. When we go from a six to a seven, you have that small gain of 2%, but even that 2% gain is worth $17. And so when we uh, put all that together cumulatively from a four to a seven, we increase that uh, conception rate 40% and we increase the revenue per cow $338. So to per put that in perspective, if you have 100 cows, you've increased that revenue uh, between $33,000 and $34,000. And so I think it's well worth our time and effort and money to think about adding that condition into our cows. So when we talk about cow herd genetics and profitability, 
I think it's very tough to measure the economic impact of our profitability traits. And when I, I look at most of those um, that are tough to measure, they include milk, energy, reproduction, and flushing ability. And the reason why is that our management and our environment have huge effects. Um, there's lots of synergies within that. I think that if you looked at all those synergies, it would look like a, a balled up bunch of net wrap. It's hard to measure what and how a cow eats on the range. I think if Miranda could figure that part out and how to measure it, Miranda would make a million dollars in research. And that milk EPDs are estimates of the impact of a daughter's milk on the production of a sire's grand progeny. And so it's not pounds of milk produced by those daughters, but the amount of weight that is attributed to milk uh, from the dam. And, and it's hard to measure the milk production of a beef cow. Most of us do not want to milk cows, and if uh, we wanted to, we'd be in the dairy business. So when we look at measurements to describe reproduction, uh, the ones on the left are pretty easy to come to. Uh, I call these pure reproduction factors. So days to puberty, so we can sit out there and watch our heifers to the first time that they cycle. Services per conception, That's a, this is a big one in the dairy business because those dairy cows have lots of reproduction issues. Age at first calving, we take it for granted that here in the US our, our heifers are gonna calve at two years of age, but in South America, it's pretty typical for those heifers to calve at three to four years of age. Uh, the average calving interval, uh, so do they calve every year on the year or some years they calve you know, 60 days later and then they catch up, what's that look like? And then the average postpartum interval. On the right hand side, we can look at reproduction factors in, in a systems approach. And so the ones that I have been talking about, calves weaned per cow exposed, the weaning rate, these in yellow are metrics that concern me a little bit. And if they're metrics that you use, that's great. I'm not saying you shouldn't use them. But here's why they bother me a little bit is because they look at pounds weaned. And when we add in pounds weaned per acres grazed, per cow exposed, um, per pound of cow exposed, all those kind of things, we are taking into account some level of milk. And I think when we start looking at trying to wean more pounds off of smaller cows, uh, something that comes into that is what I call the milk creep, and that's adding uh, milk into a cow um, and letting herself really become maybe uh, pretty tough in condition because of it. So it is said that you can't manage what you uh, don't or can't measure, and so we use EPDs to maybe try to help us measure some of these reproductive um, effects. So I'm gonna start out and talking about some EPDs here related to calving ease. So if you'll remember that the metrics in, in that weaning rate include uh, live calves that we have weaned off and pregnancy rate. Those are the two big ones. And so I'm gonna look at uh, the first ones of these weaning off and an a live calf. So the first is calving ease and our calving ease EPDs predict the percentage of calves that will be born unassisted. These are, I guess, relatively new, and when I say relatively new, they've probably been uh, in our breed EPD profiles for 15 years or so. We consider them to be a better predictor of calving ease than birth weight, and that's because a cow can have a 100-pound snake, but she can't have a 100-pound basketball. Um, and so calving ease direct uh, predicts the percentage of a sire's calves that will be born unassisted. Now, calving ease maternal, predicts the percentage of a sire's daughters who will calve unassisted. So it's important to remember uh, that one of these is their calves themselves and the other one is their daughters. And birth weight predicts the difference in weight of a sire's calves. So some examples of these, when we look at calving ease direct, uh, these are two bulls that I pulled out of a, a select sire's catalog. Uh, the first of those bulls has a calving ease direct of 10. The second has a calving ease direct of 18. That's a difference of H or negative eight. And so 
comparatively, a higher number means more calving yeast. And I know that that's counterintuitive, but you have to remember that that's a probability or a percentage, not actual pounds. And so bull ones uh, should sire calves that are 8% less likely to be born unassisted than bull two. Or if you wanna look at it on the flip side, bull two should sire calves that are 8% more likely to be born unassisted than bull one. And if you're in a place that has limited labor, uh, maybe you have some smaller framed cattle, things like that, calving yeast direct is probably pretty important to you. Now, on the other side is calving yeast maternal. So calving yeast maternal, again, is comparatively, uh, comparatively speaking, a higher number means the daughters have more calving yeast. So when we compare these two bulls again, bull one has a calving yeast maternal of plus 10, uh, bull two has a calving yeast maternal of plus 18. That means that when you compare those two sires, bull one should sire daughters who are 8% less likely to have their first calf unassisted. So 8% uh, of those, when you compare these two, you're going to have to pull calves uh, when they're um, out of 8% more of the daughters of bull one than bull two. If you look at uh, bull two, his daughters, uh, he should sire daughters who are 8% more likely to have their first calf unassisted. And so if I'm uh, calving out a bunch of first calf heifers, this is pretty important to me. One of the things to know though, is the calving yeast maternal and calving yeast direct are inversely related. Uh, birth weight. So this looks at just sheer birth weights of calves. Uh, if we look at bowl one here, he has a plus one, bull two has a minus 4.5, and these are in pounds. So the difference there is 5.5 pounds, and we would say that generally smaller birth weights are equal to less assisted births. Uh, but again, remember, a, a cow can have a 100-pound snake, but she can't have a 100-pound basketball. So uh, bull one's calves should weigh five and a half pounds more at birth than bull two's calves, or on the flip side, bull two's calves should weigh five and a half pounds less. So some relationships with calving yeast, uh, EPD. So as I had said earlier, calving yeast direct is generally inversely related to calving yeast maternal. Uh, if you look at uh, big time calving yeast direct leader bulls, they're usually pretty narrow made and narrow in the front oftentimes leads to narrow in the back. And so, uh, when I talk to herds that have had some calving problems and they've been using calving ease bulls for lots of generations on top of each other, um, I oftentimes see that their calving ease maternal in terms of their sires uh, gets to be pretty negative. Uh, when you compare calving ease direct to the growth traits, those again are typically inversely related. Now, I have some asterisks up here, and that comes down here uh, to the curve bender genetics, and, sh and those typically are made up of short gestation length genetics uh, in terms of uh, not only birth weight, but also calving yeast direct. Birth weight is typically directly related to the growth trait. So as you see, weaning weight, yearling weight go up, so does birth weight, and calving ease maternal uh, does show some evidence of being proportional to those growth traits as well, although that's not a high correlation. So let's switch gears here and talk a little bit about body condition. Um, that's a function of the amount of energy intake uh, a cow needs versus the amount of energy that she expends. So for a cow to gain condition, her energy intake needs to exceed her energy output. Uh, Jana gave me this slide, and I really love this slide. So priorities for energy use. I can remember my grandpa telling me a cow will milk herself out of production. And what he was saying is, is that a cow that is in lactation, she will milk before she adds energy reserves, before she cycles, and before she stores any excess energy. And so this is one of the reasons why we focus a lot on milk production in terms of priorities for energy use. Milk is an expensive trait, and so many of you have probably seen this graph before, and so on the left-hand side down here at one month after calving uh, to two months is when we hit milk, uh, peak milk production, and then that tapers off at weaning about seven months after calving, and then we start needing more energy to take care of that calf that's growing inside of that cow. 
And so guess what? When we're wanting to rebreed those cows, this is just about at the time that we're at, pil at peak lactation. So I put together a list of what I would consider to be EPDs that are related to body condition. Now remember, this is a tangled up, jumbled uh, ball of net wrap in terms of synergies. And so uh, the first of these is milk. And as I prefaced earlier, milk does not predict the amount of milk that a cow will produce or her uh, a heifer will produce, but it predicts the amount of growth that a calf will get from that daughter's milk and mothering ability. And so this really confounds the ability to determine how much energy or how much um, nutrition milk is taking in a herd. If we just knew that like on the dairy side that a cow is producing 80 pounds of milk a day, it would be pretty easy for us to come up and say, okay, she's going to need this much more energy. But when we don't really have that metric in the beef cattle side of our business, that becomes pretty tough. Now, Dr. Stucker, remind me at Oklahoma State, their average registered Angus cow today is producing what, 20 pounds of milk? Uh, yeah, uh, Dave Lawman did uh, look at cows in 1998 and looked at them more recently, and they went from 20 pounds to 30 pounds, basically 10 pound increase in terms of milk production, and they actually did milk the cows. Yeah. So anybody who's ever had to milk a beef cow can imagine how fun that research project was, but you can see how we have increased that amount of milk production in our beef cows. So when we look at milk EPDs, for example, and we compare these two bulls, and it's uh, bull one has 35, uh, milk EPD, bull two has 20, uh, that difference is 15. And so what that means is that the calves that are born to bull one's daughter should weigh 15 pounds more weenie than those that are uh, born to the daughters of bull two. And again, this is uh, an estimated weight from that milk production from the cow, but it's not her actual milk production. Mature weight uh, is expressed in pounds. This is one of the EPDs in the Angus profile. Um, I can't. I think Hereford also has this in their EPD profile. It's expressed in pounds and is a predictor of the difference in mature weight of daughters of a sire. In mature height EPD, again, I believe uh, it, it is in the Angus profile and I believe also the Hereford profile, is expressed in terms of inches. So we would look at this in terms of frame size, and it's a predictor of the differences in mature heights of daughters of a sire. So uh, mature weight, to use as an example, bull one has a mature weight of 36, uh, bull two has a mature weight EPD of 18. The difference is uh, 18 pounds. So the daughter sired by bull one would weigh 18 pounds more at maturity than those sired by bull two. And on the inverse side, the daughter sired by bull two would weigh 18 pounds less at maturity than those sired by bull one. So you can see that if you were running 500 pounds or 500 cows, for example, um, that would be a pretty significant difference in the amount of weight of cows that you would potentially be feeding uh, in the winter in a, a feeding situation or grazing in the summer in a grazing situation. Mature height. Uh, the daughters that are sired by bull one would be seven-tenths of an inch taller at maturity than those sired by bull two. And when we look at those numbers for those two bulls, uh, bull one is uh, 0.2 plus 0.2, bull two is a negative 0.5. So that difference again is about three fourths of an inch or the daughters that are sired by bull two would be about three fourths of an inch shorter than those sired by bull one. Um, now a really interesting EPD to me, and this comes out of the, the Angus Association profile, I um, wonder if they are far along enough, far, far along enough in its uh, development and analysis to have it really accurate, but I, I look forward to watching this, is the cow energy value or dollars EN. And it's expressed in dollars savings per cow per year, and it assesses the differences in cow energy requirements as expected dollar savings is between two sires. 
So a larger value in this is favorable when comparing two animals. And the components for their dollars EN include lactation energy requirements and energy costs associated with differences in mature cow size. So this is a EPD slash index that takes into account uh, lactation or milk and uh, cow size. So when we look at uh, dollars EN, uh, bull one has a minus 11, uh, bull two has a zero. Again, we would look at this uh, more positive number as taking less dollars and that difference is 11. And so the, dire, the daughter sired by bull one would cost $11 more to feed in terms of energy than those sired by bull two. Or the flip side is the daughter sired by bull two would cost $11 less to feed. And if you look at this on a herd basis, again, if you had 500 cows, um, that can end up being a pretty significant amount of savings over the long haul. So some strategies to optimize production. Uh, managed milk, generally our natural resources have not, cannot keep up with the increases in our milk production for most of our breeds. Uh, watch for that hidden, what I call milk creep. And so even if we think we're selecting against increases in milk production, sometimes they can still sneak in in terms of increased weaning weight. Uh, marbling is actually pretty highly correlated to milk and mature weight. I would encourage producers to optimize weaning and year, weaning yearling and mature weights. Uh, bigger is not always better. And one of the things that, that Dave Lawman talks a lot about is that our milk production keeps going up, our cow size keeps going up, our carcass weights keep going up, but our weaning weights on the commercial side of our business have stayed flat for about 15 years. And so have we hit a point in our commercial cow herds that we are increasing the amount of milk at such a level that our natural resources can't keep that milk going? And so our calves have hit, hit really their top level at where we can be in terms of weaning weight. Um, I don't know the answer, and I think it's a really uh, interesting research um, thing to look at, and Dave is really doing that. And so I look forward to that. Be aware of calving ease, both direct and maternal. I talked a little bit about that. Um, it's again, don't single trait select for just calving ease direct. And I know some operations that do that. Yes, we want an alive calf, but we also still want to have a cow that can calve on her own. Select replacement females from your oldest cows who meet your uh, confirmation targets. And I know that this is a little bit different than some other academics and, and breeders and breed organizations tell you to do. They tell you to select your replacements from your youngest females. But we know that the oldest cows in our operation, if we have a strong culling uh, practice, are there for a reason. And they're there because they can function really well in our environment and under our management. And likewise, buy your bulls from people who run cows in a similar fashion in a similar environment than you do, that you do. Um, I think that's a good way to build upon that. Now's a great time to add condition to spring calving cows. I think Jana will talk about that next week. And a live calf and a pregnant cow are worth a lot, and I hope our data has shown that. My quote, and I actually, this is what I wanted to call our series, and I think my cohorts thought maybe I was a little bit too terse, but you can't starve profit into a cow, and you can't milk it out of them. I think the data has shown this, but you can match your resources to your cattle and your management and be exceptionally profitable and uh, sustainable. And my final slide comes from Tessa Osterbauer, Tessa Keller. Uh, she's our county agent in Grant County in North Dakota. And she gave me this slide. We did a BQA meeting last Monday and she had this slide in her presentation. And I just love this slide. In fact, I, I think a lot of it. And it says long-term decisions, long-term impacts. So if we bought bulls in 2020 and we bred our first females this summer, uh, their first calves, the first calves out of those bulls will be born uh, in 2021. The first daughters of those calves will be bred in 2022 and they will calve for the first time in 2023. If we keep that bull for five years, his last calves will be born in 2025, 
and his first daughters are going to hit peak lactation, so someplace between five and eight years of age in 2028. Now let's think about this. In 2035, 15 years from now, he still can have 10-year-old cows in your herd. And so is that the impact you want of your bull, or do you want those cows to be culled out somewhere around 2028, 2029? I'm hoping that we have the genetics built into our herd to allow us to have a lot of 10-year-old cows. So with that, Dr. Stucka. Dr. Jerry Stucka joins us from a, a prominent career as a veterinarian and has had a background at uh, spending some time uh, in uh, Pfizer Animal Health and we're lucky to have him join us here at North Dakota State University and help with our stewardship approach and again kind of fits his uh, talent levels and we appreciate uh, Jerry for uh, kind of shifting the transition on how you can sustain uh, the cattle in your ranch. Go ahead Jerry. Yeah thanks Travis. I hope everyone can see me. It's good to be with you. You know there's some advantages to these Zoom meetings. That means that no, none of us have to be on the road but the disadvantage is that we don't really get to see one another, which is a pretty big disadvantage. But someday I think we'll, uh, we'll get this thing figured out and we'll be able to, to travel and interact and have good fellowship again. So anyway, thanks for, for you all being on. One of my good colleagues and good friends I see is on Dr. Mark Hilton and good to have him on as well because a lot of these things are of interest to him and interest to all the others on, that are on this program. One of the things that, uh, uh, Lisa forgot to mention is one of our teammates, Carl Hoppe, who's not on here, but he's with us too. We have a small group, uh, but I hope it, I hope and believe strongly that it's a very effective group. So, and uh, I'm just going to talk about some things related to some of these low pregnancy and weaning rates and perhaps finding answer, but it's all under this umbrella of can your system sustain the ranch? And and this has been a particular interest of mine and some of my other colleague veterinarians, including Dr. Hilton. Uh, we've kind of formed a little group called Veterinarians for the Advancement of Systems Thinking. And so it's been a, uh, a real focus of mine and, and of others for some time. And so I hope you enjoy the, what we have to offer and, and I hope there's some, maybe some pearls in here that you can take home with you. And especially if, if you've been in one of those herds that had have had some issues with low pregnancy and weaning rates uh, this year or perhaps even in past years. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna lead off with just a little bit of reiterating what Lisa was talking about. And I grabbed an old animal science textbook, actually beef cattle, seventh edition, A.L. Newman. And I had a, had a chapter in there from Larry Cundiff and Keith Gregory, who were long time employees at the Meat Animal Research Center. And, they said in that paragraph, no single factor in commercial calf, calf operation has greater bearing on production costs than percentage calf crop. And of course, Lisa kind of showed that. You know, we could, if you go to bull sales or if you're just involved in the seed stock or even, even if, as a commercial producer and looking at bull catalogs, the number of EPDs has uh, exponentially grown and sometimes it's confusing. Maybe as a commercial cattleman, all we need is just one EPD. And that's related to percent calf crop or preg rates or weaning rates. Maybe we get too many and, it's, and it confuses us and sometimes it leads us down a path that, that is causing us more harm than actual good. I wanna, I'm gonna take off on some of the things Lisa was saying as well. And <clears throat> so I look at this stewardship business and, and look at it as a beef as a business. So basically we know that 50 to 70% of the cost of keeping a cow is feeding pasture. It can be from 700 to $900 per cow per year. And up here, because we feed more harvested forages, we have to feed for greater months of the year, although we're trying to improve that as well with many different other options. But that cow cost is gonna be somewhere between 700 and $900 a year. I know other parts of the country can do it for less, but. This is kind of where we are. So the income side of that thing, though, is live calves to sell. And it's not that I don't care what they weigh, what they weigh. I do, but 
if I have a live calf to sell and he weighs 500 pounds and a live calf to sell that weighs 650 pounds, they still have value. So that live calf as a percent of cows exposed is a big deal in terms of the income and the unit cost of production. We also sell market cows and bulls and uh, some use live calves per acre, some use pounds wean or pounds of calf per acre. Some measurement of income is always important to kind of keep us on task and have some indication that we're moving in the right direction. The subtractors from the income from income are these, those open cows. In other words, those, in other words, those that fail to conceive. Now, I, I'll admit that we end up in most cases selling those cows, but still that means that there's fewer calves to sell. We have some that have early embryonic loss, some we have a stillbirth, some we have as weak calves, uh, some abortions, and then there's disease as well that contributes to calf death loss. It can be scours, can be summer pneumonias. We can have pink eye and foot rot treatments, and sometimes that carries over even in the post winning period in which we have some calves that may survive, may need treatment, and even some death loss at that point. I just did a quick grab of some North Dakota farm business management data from 2019, and I think it's a I think it's wise to just look at this a little bit. Let me back up. I was going to try and magnify that just a little bit, and now I can't find my little icons for magnifying. I hope you can see this because I'm just going to look at that left-hand column there, or the that column of beef cow calf average per cow. They had 12 farms. The average number of cows on, on those 12 farms was essentially 300. They had a really good pregnancy percentage of 95.7%. That's pretty high. A pregnancy loss percentage of somewhere around 1.8%. They called 12.4%. Now, maybe they called the opens, but I suppose there's always some of those cows that have a little attitude, some other feet problems, some feet problems, some elderly ones that it's time to go. So their calving percentage was about 94%. The weaning percentage ended up to be about 90.5%. And somehow the death loss doesn't quite add up, but calf death loss was about 4.1%. They lost some cows as well. So in the end, what an important number to look at is not just average weaning weight, but pounds weaned per exposed female, 192. In this case, and I'm not sure, I think there's some things left out on this particular business management, but their feed costs, just the average feed cost per year is $349. So if we did the math on that, then you're going you're gonna to end up with total costs somewhere in that $700 range pretty quickly. So I like to look at it this way. <laughs> I do this for BRD, for calf health and productivity. But I'll also put this together for cow, for cow reproduction, productivity, and health. You see, I think most of us understand that there's a relationship of some of these management factors, some of which we can control more than others, but a relationship of these management factors to cow reproduction, productivity, and health. And I think these are, and, and this maybe isn't all inclusive, maybe there's some others that I've left out, but I think the cow lifetime productivity and a reproduction ability and her health is related maybe starts here at fetal programming what kind of environment did that calf that's going to become part of your herd see while it was in utero what kind of stress was the mother under what uh, what kind of nutrition did she receive during gestation and then that that goes to the next step when that calf is born what kind of a mother was that cow to that calf that's going to be part of your herd and did that calf get up and nurse as quickly as it should have and obtain the immunity that it needed that it needed from that mother that we call um, passive transfer. Uh, Elisa had a slide in here in, in her in her section from Ken Odie done a number of years ago looking at body condition score and and passive transfer. And in that study at least that they showed that cows that are in a poor body condition score uh, those calves actually absorbed less of that immunity. We don't know that necessarily that's, a, that's an issue of colostrum quality. In some cases, it can be colostrum volume, but there is somewhat of a relationship with that body condition score and passive immunity as well. 
And then where's our genetic selection pressure? Lisa did a good job of covering this as well. Is it for continual growth? Is it for more milk? Is it for marbling? Or maybe is it, should there be more selection on some of those traits that we don't always think that are related to profitability, like in the Angus, Red Angus Association, uh, maintenance energy, or in the Ang Black Angus Association, dollars energy, or calving is, or stability. Like I said before, we have so many EPDs that it can actually be confusing, but if we think about this systems approach, there are some that have a greater impact on health and productivity, and I'd like to think in terms of profitability as well. I have another one in here called commingling, and sometimes we treat new arrivals into a cow herd with uh, somewhat of a passe uh, uh, response. Well, we'll just dump those cows right in the cow herd and see, and not even give it a second thought. Talk about that a little bit later in terms of biosecurity. And then the third, uh, one, two, three, four, fifth one is environment. When do we calf? When's our weaning season? Do we calve really early uh, in which we need a lot more groceries to get that cow and that calf uh, in shape for the breeding season? Do we wean at a time of the year when we have weather that's widely variable with a greater chance of increased precipitation and now in our weaning pens, we have a lot of mud and poor pen conditions to deal with. Next one is nutrition. And that relates to certainly the body condition score. This exposure can goes back a little bit to that commingling and how we handle new entries into the herd. Do we have a biosecurity plan? Do we have a vaccination protocol that we can follow? And finally, and for many of our producers, and ourselves included, is labor. There's kind of a lack of labor in our part of the world, uh, even a warm body. There's lack of warm bodies up here, and, and that's related, can be related to both quantity and quality of labor. Just want to talk just a little bit about this uh, systems reproduction program, and it, and it again relates to the things that Lisa was talking about. Where's your where's your selection pressure? And I've used this slide many times, but I I relate it to health and productivity and health and reproductivity. Selection of genetics to achieve high levels of maternal immunity are critical for managing to managing for health. When I look at the goals that I think about. In order to achieve this, I want a cow that raises me a calf every year. That's fertility, that's uh, preg rates, that's weaning rates, or so on and so forth, for 12 to 14 years. And this gets back to a, a statement that Lisa talked about, how about those older cows that have been in your herd for a long period of time and calved every year, those, there's something special about those cows that you would like to propagate. I want basically zero calving difficulty to, due to birth weight and shape. And that relates somewhat to labor. Lack of labor, if, if I'm a single individual and I'm trying to manage five to 600 cows, I really can't spend a whole lot of time worrying about whether either, even a first calf heifer or an adult cow is gonna have trouble calving due to birth weight and shape. I want optimum growth and optimum milk and I want sound confirmation. Now, optimum growth in milk is gonna be different depending on where we are in this country because the resources differ. Even, even on our place here, we have different pastures that, that are better than others. And so it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge geographical distance in order to realize that there are different optimums. It can be optimum by pasture, even on the same ranch. I use this one, this is another one of Dave Lahman's slide, and it, um, it looks at the genetic trend for yearling weight, and you can see where it's gone. And I'm not saying this is bad necessarily. We've done a tremendous job in the beef industry of creating more from less. We actually use less resources to produce more beef all the time. But how much is too much? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that question, but ha uh, producing bigger cattle all the time, there has to be an endpoint in which you decide, I guess that's big enough. And it may be different for different geographic regions or even different uh, regions of a single state or maybe even different regions of a, of a single county. I, uh, this is a famous slide for me. 
because I got myself in trouble with the Hereford Association over this one, and I it was fully unintentional, I can assure you. But it's somewhat related back to the last slide I just showed you. And I, I think the message is this, the, the, let, the, the little pearl of wisdom here is that calves from Hereford lines selected for performance had lower IgG antibody concentration than calves from the randomly selected control line. Now, why would that be? What's the reason, as we talk about EPDs, why that might be true? When we select for, for growth, and Lisa showed in some of her stuff that when you, birth weight is related to growth. The bigger the birth weight, usually the more growth you get. Well, the more growth you get, you get a bigger calf at birth. And sometimes those calves at birth are a little bit slow to get up. Some of us are old enough, perhaps in the audience, and Dr. Hilton will, is too, in, in remembering what happened when we brought over the first exotics and, we, and calving difficulties was just normal business. We did cesareans and on first calf heifers, we did cesareans on adult cows, and it was because of high birth weights. And so I think some of this, even though this is a paper from 1984, I think there's some relevance to this as well, that when you select for growth, select for performance, there's a chance that those calves don't get enough immunity into the system, and they tend to be ones that are at greater risk for getting sick and perhaps even dying later on. This is the uh, slide that, that Lisa referenced. This is the Ohio, or Oklahoma State commercial cows, milk yield over time. In 1998, they had cows, in fact, I was a little bit off here. They had cows that produced about 18 pounds of milk at peak milk yield in May. Some years later, 17 years later, they, their milk yield was 31 pounds. Um, and remember, that's never without a cost. Those cows undoubtedly are bigger and undoubtedly are gonna eat more in order to produce that kind of milk. So with a in a limited resource system, you won't be able to run the same number of cows per acre as you did with those lower milking cows. So nothing's ever free. The only other issue I bring up, at a, and it's related to milk production, now, granted, this is a dairy cow uh, article, but, but the title of it was Re Regulation of Colostrum Formation in Beef and Dairy Cows, Journals of Dairy Science. When you get a high level of milk production, we know in dairy cattle that the volume dilutes the concentration of immunoglobulins. So can I have cows that have so much milk, even beef cows, when they calve so much colostrum that that amount of immunity that's in the colostrum in order for that calf to get what it needs is going to have to that calf is going to have to drink a greater uh, volume and i think that may be happening with some of our really high milk producing beef cows today so what's the limit on milk production what's the limit on milk epds i don't know if i can tell you and again that'll vary a little bit by where you are living in the state and in the region and in the part of the country. And, and the part of the reason why it's such a uh, expensive resource is that not only do they milk more, but they have higher, higher year-long maintenance requirements. They're built differently than a cow that has a lower milk EPD or lower milk production. And, and most of that is related to the greater visceral organ mass relative to empty body weight. And we see that in dairy cows. They're made different. Those cows that milk more, they have greater ruminal size, small and large intestine, liver, heart, and kidneys. Okay. So we've had reports of, of I guess, reproductive failures this fall. I guess we do every year. And sometimes the answers are not easy to figure out. And I know many times we would like to find the easy answer. Um, and it's usually not evident. Um, and it takes more of a systems approach to, to try and ask the right questions, have the right information from the producer to be able to point in some direction to make a management change. And what I've done here is just lay out some questions that I will ask when I'm dealing with reproductive failures. What time of the year is the calving season? I mean, that seems like a 
kind of an elementary basic question, but there are some reasons for asking it. If I'm calving in late winter and early spring, those cows need more energy in the diet to prepare themselves for, for the rebreeding. The other thing I'll add in here is somewhat of a caveat. I've experienced this several times. Sometimes we get them yearling heifers a little bit too fleshy, a little bit too fat, and we turn them to grass and expect them to breed. We're turning them out a little bit later and just right onto grass after having been confined and being fed. Those fat heifers will actually go into a weight loss program and it will dramatically impact fertility. So that's sometimes where having too much body condition score is not good during that breeding season, especially in those young yearling heifers. On the other hand, if we're calving later, if we're calving late spring, summer calving type of uh, breeding season, that, that brings another <laughs> set of risk into it in, in that if we start having dry weather early, we're going to have a deep quantity, but also quality, especially in late July and August, which can impact fertility. So we need to keep in mind that no matter when you calve, and, so, and, and many of our producers have moved their calving season later because they don't have as much labor as they used to. They're having more cows. They don't want to calve in, in, in confinement, which leads to greater disease problems. But just keep in mind that forward quality out here starts to decline at the end of July and it can impact fertility. The calving season distribution is always a good one to look at. So pe most people keep a calving book and sometimes it's not totally 100% accurate. And sometimes you have to read into it more than what's been recorded. But if you can somehow get an idea of when the calves are born and you can actually break that into cycles, like the first 21 days, first 45 days, so on and so forth. It may give you some information that can lead you into a, a certain direction in ter terms of trying to solve what's happened. So I say here, the information may provide some evidence of inadequate bull power, which may be related to dominant bulls, lame bulls, injured bulls, inadequate body condition score in the cows and cow nutrition during the breeding season. So it doesn't, it's not extremely specific, but it, perhaps points you in a direction that you need to investigate a little bit closer. A large number of cows determined to be pregnant late in the breeding season could be an indication of reproductive disease such as Vibrio or Trick, in which case they've had some embryonic loss. This is just a simple uh, calving distribution I just pulled up and I, I wanted to magnify this, but I don't think that I can. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So this isn't one that I'm telling you, you should strive for. We talk about striving to get most of those calves, maybe even up to 70% of those calves born in the first cycle. This one's just showing a, a distribution of just slightly less than 50% born in the first cycle. And then of those that didn't calve in that time, well, we got 30% uh, of those bred in the second and then a number bred in the third. That's just an example of what a calving distribution uh, would look like. I throw this one in here. I got this from my good friend Chance Armstrong at LSU. This is a little trichomoniasis organism that can be responsible for the, some of those cows. They might conceive early but then suffer embryonic loss and those are the cows that'll get bred perhaps 60 days later and you'll have a bunch of late late breeding, late calving cows as a result of this organism. I understand there's um, uh, a couple of vaccine candidates for this organism. One I believe is at LSU and another one I just saw being uh, pursued at, at Kansas State University. So there may be some help for that, for that organism there in terms of control. The number of calves born as it relates to the number of cows determined to be with calf at the previous pregnancy check-in event. So this number could indicate fetal loss due to abortions. Now remember that some of these abortions, some of this, uh, these calves that are slipped are not noticed. Usually the ones later will be noticed unless you got a lot of coyotes. Abortions not noticed or visual abortions and stillbirths. This can be evidence of fetal infections such as BVD, IBR, lepto, neospora, listeria, fungal infections, 
and really a host of other possible pathogens. In addition, low conception rates and, and fetal losses can be due to high nitrates, phytoestrogens, mycotoxins, like zeralinone, ergot, in, in forage, and, and certainly some grain resources. So this list is pretty lengthy, but there are some things we can do to at least narrow this list somewhat. Uh, but just having that number, in other words, a number of calves born as it relates to the number of cows determined to be pregnant, may, may be able to point you in a certain direction. Cow body condition score by age. Younger cows, two and three, and those greater than 10 or greater than 12 will carry less condition than middle-aged cows. And again, we said this earlier, we'll have a direct relationship on the ability to rebreed and conceive for the next season. Those young cows are still growing, they're lactating, and older cows will have more difficult staying in condition as most of those incisor teeth will be missing. For those of you that have mouthed a lot of cows and determined age and determined gummer cows, well, you, you'll understand what's going on here. And sometimes in these cows, if they're not keeping up, it, it, we may need to sort these. Sort the younger ones and older cows into different groups to calve and then different groups for feeding just prior to the breeding season. Um, I brought this one up as well because I thought this was a good one to look at. We don't necessarily do a lot of this. I'll make a couple comments about this, but this is actually a calving distribution by sire. And in this part, and in this one, they, they uh, calving distribution, 21, 45, and so on, 60 days. You can see that there's been one bull in here. These are the bulls with the greatest number of calves sired per pasture. That happens a lot. You've got bulls with, that have differences of libido and difference in dominance, and they're the ones that sire the most calves. And sometimes that can be a, actually can be a problem in terms of if that dominant sire is bad, or if, if he's keeping the other and, uh, bulls away from breeding at all, then you, you might have an issue with the dominant sire. I threw this slide in here too, just to remind us that there sometimes is an end when you have to call enough. This, this cow here is gonna turn 17. She's still raising a good calf, good feet and good udder, but sometimes one more year is one too many and I'm surprised at her fertility at her age, but those are pretty special cows that can keep doing it every year. Low pregnancy and weaning rates, finding answers, vaccines are important. The reason I put this in there is we don't vaccinate for everything. We vaccinate for the things that we think are at, at somewhat of a risk of being present in the herd. And we look for vaccines that are effective and backed up by science and they're safe to use. So I've got on here annual IBR, BRSV, BVD, Lepto. Now BRSV is really not a reproductive issue. Uh, in other words, we don't recognize BRSV as being a, a fetal, uh, related to fetal losses, but certainly IBR, BVD, Lepto. I, I've left off Vibrio or Campylobacter. Uh, for some herds, that's still an issue, and it may become more of an issue as fewer people continue to vaccinate for Vibrio. Trick for some herds is a is a risk, and so this is just a generalized statement of things that I think is are important on an annual basis for most cow herds to vaccinate the cow herds again. Um, one of the other things I want to remind us, and this perhaps relates a little bit to our current situation with coronavirus, when ca when animals are vaccinated, when people are vaccinated, it actually kind of reduces pathogen stress. And by that, I mean it takes a greater dose, a uh, bigger sneeze, if you will, to, to actually cause disease, cause infection and cause disease. Okay, so vaccination has several important things to remember other than just uh, decreasing that risk. And it reduces the spread of shedding of those infectious organisms from one animal to another. Now, some of those organisms are not spread from cow to cow. Lepto, lepto can be, but lepto can also be spread by other wild animals. And that's why lepto is usually in most of these cow herd vaccination strategies. 
Cow age and bull age and numbers by pasture. Younger and older cows in common pastures, regardless of bull numbers, will generally have a greater number of open cows. So I want to know if I'm trying to find answers for these low pregnancy, low weaning rates, I want to know where those cows were pastured. If they were pastured together, if they pastured separately. And the number of cows exposed per bull is important, but perhaps even more important is libido and bull age. I use this example. Older, and I talked about this earlier, older and more dominant bulls tend to serve the majority of cows. The of bulls may not be as important as the age of the bulls in the pasture. Let's say I'm running two 14 to 18 month old bulls with a single dominant older bull. We think we got three bulls in there. You may only have one and a half because the dominant bull dominates the breeding. And so that can be a problem. It can be okay if, if all the rest of the bulls are on their toes and doing what they're supposed to do. And certainly all bulls should have a, a, a semen evaluation prior to the breeding season. And bulls from pastures with low pregnancy rates should be tested again. I, uh, I put this slide in there just to remind us how, how, that, uh, how bulls have changed over the years. I found this old catalog. This was from the 50s, imported prints of Rowley. Not a very big animal. This was from 1991 and this is from a more recent bull. So bulls have changed. But we expect them to do the right thing. We expect them to be fertile and we expect them to want to breed cows and that doesn't always happen. I included some slides in here on, on semen evaluation. This picture on the left here, uh, let's see if I can, is live semen. When you get your bulls uh, subject to a semen evaluation, it's not good enough just to look at the semen in a, in a tube and determine whether that bull is good. That semen needs to be put under a slide and have some evaluation of motility. And it also needs to take part of that sample and stain that sample and determine whether there is proper morphology. I see two semen here that look pretty normal. Another one over here. There's some here that don't look quite right. So your veterinarian will determine the percent of these semen that look normal and, and, and will give a score. I'm not so much concerned about the score as I am whether they pass or whether they fail. This image on the right hand slide is just anatomy of the testicle. Uh, it's important to remember that it's basically a 60 day cycle to produce semen. So what you're looking at is a point in time. Something could have happened along the way that disrupted that cycle and and cause some of the semen you're looking at to be bad. So I certainly usually give bulls a second chance to uh, pass a bovine semen evaluation. Uh, but I, also a reminder to check testicle size. I was just visiting with someone the other day who had bought a bull with a 31 centimeter testicle size and that, that uh, size of those testicles would not meet the standard for any breed that I'm currently aware of as a yearling. I found this really interesting. This is from Albert Barth, who was one of the gurus of, of bull fertility. He looked at 209 bulls over several years. They were all greater than or equal to two years old and evaluated them for physical soundness, scrotal circumference, semen quality, and serving capacity. Now we try and evaluate all three of those, physical soundness, circumference, and semen quality. Most of us don't get the chance to evaluate them for serving capacity. And yet that's a pretty big deal, but we can't really get that done in our current system, at least very well. So of those 209 bulls, 72.2% were satisfactory when they looked at all four of those parameters. 12% were questionable, 15.8% were unsatisfactory. The reasons for questionable and unsatisfactory, in other words, if you add the 12 and the 15 together, you got 23.8%. Low, surfing capa low serving capacity was 15.8 percent of them. Physically unsound, 3.8. Small scrotal circumference, 6.2. And poor semen quality, 14.4. So there are reasons, and this is related to why semen evaluations are important. Even though we're not looking at serving capacity, we've got somewhere around 25 percent of those that were either physically unsound, small scrotal circumference, or poor semen quality. So Dr. please don't forget. Yes. What does low serving capacity mean? What it means they don't have much libido, Lisa. They don't want okay. to get after it. 
Okay. That's Thank a you. little hard to evaluate for our producers to evaluate, but I always tell myself and our producers, you got to get out there and look once in a while. You can't just assume that everything's happening. Uh, it may not be. So that's as best as we can do. There are some ways you can try and measure serving capacity, and they did a number of years ago, but I don't know that anybody's really doing that much today. Um, this is just related a little bit to my commingling comment earlier. All purchased in additions to the herd should have a testing and vaccination history. If not, then you better implement some type of quarantine procedures. And even with testing and vaccination, please don't introduce those new additions into the herd just prior to the start of the calving season. Or I would even say just prior to the start of the breeding season for new bulls. You gotta allow those bulls to acclimate to the new environment, to uh, the new cattle and bulls. What we try and do is pen next to home bulls for several days so they can scream at each other for a few days. If a battle ensues when you try and mix them, then you better separate it and try it later. And don't put new introduced bulls into breeding pastures with others. I've got a goofy little uh, story here that I'm not sure is true necessarily. We did try it. There seems to be something to it. The idea is putting apple cider vinegar as a pour on on bulls that you're trying to introduce. And it seems to uh, somewhat negate the, uh, it must be the smell or something of new bulls that you've introduced. And it seems like it really tends to reduce uh, fighting amongst bulls that haven't been together for, for a while. What's always interesting to me is that even when you separate bulls for a couple of days, when you put them back together, then they have to decide who's the strong one again. So it's, it's, it's a management thing that we all need to pay attention to because we don't want broken legs. We don't want an animal hurt that just because we were in a hurry to put them back together. We talked about a lot of things today, but I, I think the important point to make is that when you're not meeting the goals that you have set for yourself, for the ranch, for benchmark goals, for reproductive efficiency, for preg rates, for weaning weights, rates, look at the whole system. Um, it's rarely a vaccine issue. You know, I'll get the comment, Doc, we got too many open cows, do we need to change our vaccines? Um, no, unlikely, unless, unless you're not vaccinating at all, then that's a different, that's a different question, different set of questions. But it takes a systems approach to try and understand what the problem is, what to investigate, and, and most important of all, for veterinarians and others that are involved with these, to be able to listen and to be able to gather the right information. But we talked about branch resources, nutrition, genetic selection, pressure, where it is, environment, and biosecurity. And these are complicated systems, and, one, and a move in one impacts other parts of the system. So, but it's a great occupation, profession, if you will, to be in. I hope this has been helpful to you. I use this last slide here, if I may, a system with a societal license, at least we have a societal license in this country still to raise cattle for food. And I think it comes to us from a long, long time ago where in the book of Psalms, it says he causes grass to grow for the cattle and crops for man to cultivate, bringing forth from food from the earth. That's the system. So thank you very much. I'll turn it back to uh, Travis if you will, and I will stop sharing this slide if I can. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, good job, Dr. Stucka. Um, so I'm going to uh, moderate the, these, and uh, again, we're at 749, but we're gonna allow some questions to happen uh, as those come in, and I would welcome all of our people to put into the question and answer period. Um, but one of, my, one of the questions that kind of comes up is that, and this is to both of you, is that when we change the cow uh, body condition score from a four to a seven, as um, Lisa said, is that we can return potentially up to $330 um, per cow. Um, but where, so when we're looking at that body condition score, and I guess I'm, I'm gonna bring this question in just a little bit tighter from, the um, first calf heifer to the second calf heifer, 
um, is that when can we make those changes? And so it's November 24th. Um, do we still have the opportunity to make those changes to kind of pull them back up? Um, obviously, we're not at the stage of rebreeding, and we know that we lose so many from the, the ones that, that even had a calf. And so how can we look forward to kind of cranking up that body condition score? Question is yours. Lisa, did you want to take that one or do you want me to take it? You start. Okay. So November 24th, we got cows that we think where they're a little bit thin still because we still have the calves on them maybe. Uh, so they're still lactating. They're trying to eat crop residue. They might be on some cover crop that's been froze out. We might be feeding them out on, on crop residue. But one of the things you can do is you can take the calves off. <laughs> that that's a pretty big step right there. And once you do that, and the, and the cows are kind of right I, in in terms of in terms of utilizing resources, you can put weight on a cow really quickly uh, once you remove that lactation pressure. Uh, if 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 you have if the calves are still on them, when you feed cows and calves together, you have to allow for the calves eating. A fair amount of feed at this time of the year so it's not just feeding the cow you're feeding the calves too now i will i'll add this little thing in there with feeding cows and calves together it's actually a good thing for a short period of time it teaches the calves to eat and so when you bring them in for weaning they already know how to eat and so there's there's a plus to doing it for a short period of time agreed travis when are we looking at calving in you said something about um first calvers so these are yearling heifers that are getting ready to calve in the spring or that they are first calvers going on their second lactation well i'm, I'm going to say that they're the first calvers that are coming into march i'm going to say that those are past that um you know we we're already pushed past those animals um you know that that are still in uh, the, the calving standpoint, hopefully, um, but I, what I would say is the next level of, can, can we get them back in line now, now that the, even we have something in the utero now? I think easily, you know, if you uh, look at a nutrition standpoint, and as Dr. Stuck has said, if they have calves on them, it's a great opportunity to pull some calves off. And, um, you know, the longer that you are from calving, the more chance you have to add that condition and to do more economically. Um, so if you're looking at being a, a calving operation in March, you've got what, about four, four and a half months from now. If you're calving in January, you better be getting after that. And uh, you know, in terms of being in North Dakota, our county agents can help um, producers develop rations to get those cows back in shape. Um, and those, our county agents generally consult with us in doing that. If you're out of state, I, I think the other counties have that, uh, other states, county offices have those opportunities as well. But, you know, I would say start now. It's much easier to put weight on a cow now than, especially when it's nice weather. You know, uh, I think our, and Jana, you can pipe in here. She's the nutritionist amongst us, but uh, the, um, Tipping point in terms of weather is something like 16, 15, 16 degrees, with, uh, even with wind chill. Well, we haven't had very many days like that this fall, and so it's a lot easier to add condition when it's not cold. And I, I like to do that before it's cold, and it's certainly more economical. So, Lisa, just a follow-up. Uh, do you want us to add more hay to our ration, or do you want us to add more grain to our ration? Well, I want you to test your feed stuffs to see what's in them. Is okay. What I really want you to do. But, you know, generally, if your cows are thin, um, we're going to need a little bit of protein, but we're going to need more energy is a general rule. And so in, when we talk about, I think, energy in, in beef cow diets, we're going to need some TDN um, in those diets. But test your forages, test your feed, see what you have. You know, in the Northland here especially, we're really, really blessed to have a whole lot of stuff that we can feed cows pretty economically. So here's a fun one that's very philosophical in my personal opinion, uh, but has anyone looked at the correlation between some production EPDs like yearling weight 
and morbidity in the feedlot. Not to my knowledge, but I, um, I'm going to lean on Dr. Stucka to look at this. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, only, the, the only one I can think of, and that was the one I shared on Hereford cattle, which got me in trouble. But it's what it seems like is if you look at enough uh, passive immunity literature, that we tend to think still that, well, if they didn't get enough passive transfer of immunity, those are the greater risk of getting sick and perhaps dying at a young age. Well, a number of years ago, Louis Perino and then later on, Rene Duell and others looked at differences in the level of concentration of immunity from passive transfer and actually related it to post weaning uh, morbidity and mortality as well. So there is, there is some data on that. Um, it, it's not 100% it's not correlation necessarily, but if you want an animal to have the right start, um, that passive transfer is extremely important and when you look at growth there seems to be some there's a whole lot of parts to that system that are in, becoming impacted by your quest for more growth and does it impact quality of colostrum in the cow herself because she doesn't get enough energy and protein in her diet to, to form quality colostrum did that was that calf a little bit bigger at birth because he was a calf that had more growth programmed into him genetically and you didn't get up and nurse right away. It's a whole host of things that can happen that impacts morbidity and mortality, not just early in life, but certainly later on as well. And in fact, there's some dairy research that tells us that those dairy calves, heifers, dairy heifer calves, that received two liters versus four liters of colostrum at birth, those that received four liters actually milked more even into their second lactation than those that did not. So it's, it's not just always health, but there's other production parameters as well that it seems to be associated with getting the right start. Absolutely, Dr. Stucka, and I, I appreciate that uh, uh, approach to kind of bring things together. Uh, but uh, I think that if we look at everything uh, involved, I mean, some, some people can make their decision of whether that's a, a growth related or kind of balancing some of the um, portion of our production system. And that's, that's why we've done this webinar. And I'm going to, uh, since I get the opportunity to do this, um, is that we can kind of evaluate where, where we're at. And is there anything relative to weaning weight that happens, you know, that, that isn't part of the milker and I know that we talked about milk relative to our our feedstuffs and to and and our operations as well and so Dr. Stucka you said about moving the calving period um, farther on but is there do you recommend or where should we be relative to just kind of thinking about looking at the milk EPD and that, this is probably to both of you of making sure that you match your environments right well, I'm going to go first, and the reason I'm going to go first is I'm going to ask Dr. Stucka a question. So, and it's related to this. So, if you have a herd that the majority of their opens are someplace in that five to seven, five to eight year of age, does that lead you to believe that maybe they're pushing that milk a little further than where they should be, Dr. Stucka? Yeah, no, I wouldn't just, I wouldn't come to that conclusion necessarily. And this is where all of these type of investigations, you actually have to have boots on the ground, you have to have eyes on what's going on. It could be, it relates back to the last slide you had, that they, they had a couple years in there where they, they made some selection on a single trait, and now I got a group of five and six year olds that are heavy milkers. So that, that could be it, but typically by the time they reach that five and six year age, They've gone through the tough times as a young cow, and a second calver, and if they've made it that far, it's unlikely to be milk uh, at that stage. Okay, anything else to add? Um, Lisa, are we good? No, I think we're good. At, I, I would awesome. say this, that if, we, if you're in a, a situation where, for example, you think your milk has gotten a little high, 
And trust me, it's easy to have that happen. My husband and I were discussing this this week that, you know, we, we're pretty, we think we're tough on selecting, not against milk, but certainly watching it. And we think it's creeping into our herd as well. And um, so if, you, if you're in the position of any of the traits, look at the bulls that you have purchased the last however many years, five, six years, that you have daughters coming out of them. And just map out on a piece of paper where their EPDs for those traits are. And then look at the, the breed averages and where they rank against those. And you know, if you think your cows are getting too big, look at some yearling weight and say, okay, our bulls are in 110, 112 for yearling weight. You know, maybe we wanna moderate that. So we're gonna look at bulls this year that are in the 90 for yearling weight range. Or for milk, if you know, they're all looking in the 30 range and we wanna moderate that, maybe we need to start looking at some bulls that are in that 20 range. It's really easy to walk into a bull sale and pick what you have at home because we like looking at our own cows for the most part. Dr. Stucka and uh, Lisa, great question. Uh, why do you feel, pay attention, why do you feel average weaning weights have not increased in recent years when a lot of bulls are sold for weaning weight EPD? I, I think it's because we, are, we have exceeded, exceeded the, uh, resources and what they have to give to these cows. Um, they will only milk so much if you feed them so much. You know, I, we've gone from, cow weight has definitely increased over the years. So we ran, let's say we ran uh, 100 cows on a certain piece of ground uh, 30 years ago and they were all 1,200 pounds, which they never are, of course, but we'll just, for our purposes, say they're 1,200 pounds. Another 15 and 1600 pounds, we're still running 100 cows on that ground. Well, there's not enough forage quantity out there for those calves to, to have the weaning weights that you've so desired. I, I just, we've outstripped what that ground can produce, at least if we're going to still continue to use native pastures. Now, if we want to raise them in confinement, that's different. We can have huge milk, uh, EPDs probably. But then you start running into mastitis and a whole lot of host of other issues with too much milk production as well. And so there's a fine line in there, but I think that's what's happened is that we've exceeded the resources that we are using to run our cow-calf operations on. And uh, we're just not seeing the benefit in terms of if, we, if our desire is to increase weaning weight. Dr. Stucka, I would have to agree with that, that um, even as we dig for uh, increase in the weaning weight is that we have probably exceeded some of the resources and potentially some of those um, would be from at least precipitation uh, that has happened in some of our portion of the state in North Dakota. Uh, but uh, that was uh, very well done. Lisa, do you have anything to add on that particular question? So Dave Lawman has done some work at Oklahoma State addressing that question exactly. And uh, I was looking for a slide that I might have had that um, showed that but what his work shows and they had done this also at clay center at the mark lab usda mark lab is that no matter they could never find a peak in milk production in a set of angus cows and so um they were feeding angus cows basically almost a tmr that was pretty similar to a finishing ration and their milk production was still increasing and uh, they have a set of Hereford cows in that data as well at Mark. And interestingly, and I, I'm a little surprised that the, the genetics are so different, but in that set of Hereford cows, you could feed those Hereford cows the same diet and their milk production levels off. And so uh, in some, some part of our genetic makeup of these cattle, we have um, come to the point that our cows are going to milk to their resources, as Dr. Stucka said. And when we are in a limited resource situation, I think that that is a limiting factor to uh, what, what our calves are going to wean off. Now, if uh, we have some genetically high growth cattle that aren't related to milk, maybe that's a little different. But I think within our resources, um, our, our natural resources are being the limiting factor probably to weaning weight. 
And on the flip side, those cows are trying to still produce as much as they can and not building back on, on their condition. Absolutely, that's very, very good. And uh, I appreciate uh, Dr. Stucka on shaping the discussion uh, towards the reason why our people that have joined us would be best beneficial to join us next week um, for our event, uh, because I do believe that it's still uh, managing our operations and hopefully that we can sustain our operations and sustain the beef cattle that we have on our ranch. And so unless there's uh, any further questions, um, I will welcome that uh, those of us give a virtual round of applause to our presenters, uh, Ms. Lisa Peterson and Dr. Jerry Stucka for their help and their portions for helping us out this evening. Thank you so much, everybody, and hopefully you will join us in one week. Thanks so much. Happy Thanksgiving, friends. Remember to spare a turkey's life and eat some beef. Eat prime rib. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you.